On the previous page of notes, we mentioned that we never accept or prove either hypothesis because without having access to the entire population, we don't know the exact values of the parameter. Hmm. So that means that when we make a decision, since we don't have access to the whole population, we could be making errors. Ah, this is actually one of the most important topics by far in the whole course, especially in terms of real life application. This is chock-a-block full of it. All right, and also one of my favorite topics. So let's think about this. When we make a decision, we're deciding somehow magically in step five to either not reject the null hypothesis or reject the null hypothesis. Fine. But there's an actual situation. There's real life up here, right? So this is real life, the whole population. And when we have that decision, there are two possibilities for truth. It, it could be true that the null hypothesis is true. In other words, the alternative hypothesis is false. That could happen, right? They go together. So if the null is true, the alternative is false. Or it could be that the null is false and the alternative is true, right? Those are the two real life ways to think about this. Hmm. Okay, so if I did not reject the null hypothesis and the null hypothesis was true, I made a correct decision. I let stand the null hypothesis and it was true, so yay. But if I rejected that null hypothesis and that null hypothesis was true, then I made a type one error. Mm, I did something bad, right? And the problem is you can't guarantee this will never happen. As a matter of fact, we'll talk about that. And then what if the null hypothesis was false, but I let it stand? I did not reject it. I let it slide. Then I made a type two error. And then if the null hypothesis was false and I rejected it, then that's a correct decision. It was a bad hypothesis and I rejected it. So that's a correct decision. And the thing is, when we do a hypothesis test, all four outcomes could happen. All right, let's see a real life, very important example. Let's talk about the U.S. criminal legal system. Okay, so in U.S. criminal law, by definition, I'm, I'm going to write it in both places, the null hypothesis is supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. So that will be our null hypothesis. The defendant is innocent. That will be the null hypothesis. And the defendant is guilty. Right there. All right, now we are going to fill out this table, this grid, very important grid to fill out. And we're going to have to do this multiple times in the course. All right, let's start with the reality, real life, actual situation. What could be going on? Okay, so up here, if the null hypothesis is true, that means the defendant is truly innocent. Did not do whatever crime this is. If the null hypothesis is false, that means that the alternative is true and that would mean that the defendant is truly guilty. And I think I'll usually write actual situation right here, but I could sometimes write reality, right? That's what's going on. So this is reality up here. Now we don't really know what these are. <laughs> reality, you don't get to know these things because you're not there. You're not all knowing and all, all powerful, right? You're not omniscient. So, but those are the two possibilities. Now, what about your decisions, right? So if you're on the jury or if you're the judge in this case, then you can have verdicts. So the verdict would be, well, if I do not reject the null hypothesis, if I don't reject this, ah, in, in the US, we do not say innocent. We say not guilty. That's our verdict, which is essentially saying, eh, I still think you did it but I couldn't prove it, right? Kind of similar to hypothesis testing, right? So the verdict is not guilty. This one would be that the verdict is guilty. All right, now there are four corners here. 
up in this top left corner. This is a defendant that is truly innocent. Moving down here, the verdict was not guilty. This is a correct decision by the jury or the judge. I'm going to give it a smiley face, right? This was an innocent person walked free right? or was let go. Yay, that's good, right? That's what you want, right? So then, um, actually, I'm going to do the bottom right corner because this is another correct decision. Right? We can give it another smiley face if you like. Which is a guilty person, person that truly is guilty, is going to be convicted. So a guilty person, of course, we can argue about whether the laws are applied fairly and whether guilty people are always given the same amount of sentences for their crimes, but that's a whole other discussion for another day. So a guilty person convicted. But nevertheless, this is those two corners are how it's supposed to work, right? But the trouble is that you can never stop the errors from creeping in. There are two errors that can happen. So in the bottom left corner, let's do this. This would be a person that is innocent, but is convicted. So an innocent person is convicted, is wrongfully convicted, as a matter of fact. Hmm. That is not good, right? That is not good at all. That is a false conviction or a wrong conviction. And that is a type one error. Now over here in this corner, we have another problem. This is a guilty person that was let go. Hmm. So a guilty person is wrongfully set free. Mm, that's not good, right? So it's not really an exoneration. It's a false, false innocence, if you will. So it's, um, it's wrongful. It doesn't have quite the name that this does. All right, but this is a type two error. Exoneration doesn't count because exoneration is um, is something else. We're going to talk about that in just one second. So, but this is a wrongful, not guilty verdict, right? I don't have a good way to say that. Um, or a false, if you will, a false, not guilty verdict. How about that? Because I already said the word wrongful up above. Now, they are both terrible. Um, they're both not good, but they're both going to happen because we can never be 100% sure of anything because we're not omniscient. Now, in the case of the criminal justice system, many would argue that this one is the worst of the two. And there's actually been way more of that going on than you might think because, and I can show you, um, and which is not to say that the other ones don't happen either, um, but the other ones are a little bit harder to get your hand on. So these, this is a Wikipedia page devoted just to wrongful convictions in the United States. There is something called the Innocence Project, which is based at the University of Michigan, which is close to where I am living and working. And it has had tons and tons and tons of people um, exonerated. Exonerated after eight years, exonerated after 15 years, 20 years, 17 years, 30 years, 12 years. These are people that were wrongfully convicted and were eventually let go due to a variety of factors. Um, often DNA evidence proves that they never did it. 
Um, that's especially true for some of these cases that are long-term cases for 27 years, served for 26 years. And then DNA evidence gets retested and it shows that this person never did it or gets tested in the first place. Because some of these older convictions were the nascent stages of DNA evidence. Matter of fact, some of the earliest cases of the Innocence Project were from people that never had the DNA evidence at all because they didn't know about DNA back in the 70s and 60s and so on. Okay. And if you're interested in more on this, there is a podcast called the Wrongful Conviction Podcast. And you can see they interview and they have a, had so far 11 seasons worth of people that are interviewed after being wrongfully convicted, um, which is kind of amazing. As a matter of fact, um, the convictions in Chicago, for example, were so bad, um, the police have now um, been found guilty of torturing defendants into false confessions. And the city of Chicago's had to pay millions of dollars out to uh, people that they've had to let go because they were wrongfully convicted. And that's just in Chicago. Uh, there was also a case, I believe it was in Massachusetts, of a person that was running the state crime lab that's supposed to do DNA testing. And the person that was running it actually was a scammer and didn't actually have the degree, I believe, or something to that effect. But anyway, suffice it to say that they actually had to let go a whole bunch of people or retest their cases because they never did um, the DNA evidence. They never actually tested it and they ruined and destroyed the samples because they didn't know what they were doing because the person in charge of the lab was not doing their job, amazingly enough. So this happens a ton. Um, this happens also, especially in my soap operas, <laughs> because otherwise you'd have no villains in your soap operas um, and your, um, sometimes in your comic books and things like that. But um, that that's particularly funny. So, but it, it's it's not funny in real life, of course, because you don't want you know killers walking free. So you don't want you don't want this to happen either. I mean, they're both really, really, really bad. The trouble is what what systems are in place for capturing them. So people that are wrongfully let, set free, hypothetically speaking, you catch them later on other charges. For example, that's what they did with Al Capone. Al Capone, they knew was a gangster and a killer, but they caught him on tax charges, right? They caught him on tax fraud and put him away for life because of taxes, right? So they caught him for something else. Now, it doesn't always work out that nicely, but that, that would be great. Do we have systems in place to let people be set free? And if they are set free after 30 years, does your state have something in place to let it be that their records are expunged? Does your state have something in place to compensate them for their time? Many states do. More than half of the states do. Um, the state that I'm living in, however, does not. So Michigan does not do anything for you. As a matter of fact, somebody was just let go last year. So that'd be 2019 after like 29 years in the Jackson prison. And they were like, sorry, our bad. See ya. So that was it. So, so that was really, really bad. And there was a lot of press for that. But it does happen. It happens very regularly. Every year, many people are set free after many years behind bars for crimes they did not commit. And of course, this is full of real life context for exactly what we're talking about in statistics and hypothesis testing. <laughs>